Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Granite Creek, which flows just northwest of Mount Eilson in Denali National Park, Alaska. The creek bed is thick with alder and willow bushes, limiting visibility to a very short distance. In the valley bottoms, the land is flat but quickly slopes upward with each peak in the area rising over 5,000 feet in elevation. The jagged peaks here are alpine, which leaves them barren of trees. Dull sheep somehow eke out a living in this cold and bleak environment. In the plants along the creeks, moose, caribou, and marmot seek shelter from the elements. Hiding from wolverines, wolves, lynx, black bears, and brown bears isn't an easy task, but somehow they manage. In Denali National Park, roads provide access to trailheads which lead to panoramic views that few human feet had trod. This area is in nearly the same condition as it had been for thousands of years. Many of the animals here seldom, if ever, see human beings, let alone feel a substantial impact from their presence. Hiroshi Tokura was a 25-year-old man on August 11, 1980. He and three of his friends were hiking through the park, taking breathtaking photos and otherwise enjoying each other's company in the beauty of the park. As the hikers approached the edge of Granite Creek, the bushes grew thick and tall. The babbling of the creek plays its own peaceful tune as occasional breezes wave through the treetops. The hikers were immersed in the scents, sounds, and sights of Mother Nature's art gallery. Hiroshi was leading the hiking group as they navigated the trail through the brush. As he pushed the willow limbs out of his way, he heard a strange sound only a few yards in front of him. The sound reminded him of a large dog's bark, but resonated in deeper, longer tones. Hiroshi knew that moose and caribou didn't make this sound, but was worried that he might find out what animal does. As soon as he glanced around a willow bush, an enormous brown bear came into view. The bear had already been alerted to the hiker's presence, as evidenced by its woof in their direction. They didn't know enough about bears to heed its warning, though, and really couldn't have done much about it, given their proximity to the bear. From about six yards away from Hiroshi, the brown bear's low build and massive musculature easily pushed its way through the brush in an eruption that panicked the hikers. Behind the bear, he could see the brush parting as another animal was fleeing. Hiroshi began yelling at the bear and took steps backward to put distance between himself and the bear. He knew that the paltry steps he was taking away from the bear were being quickly outpaced by the bear's leaps. This is where the record gets a little confusing. Sometimes when people experience a traumatic experience, they do things they do not remember later. One of the hikers states that Hiroshi turned and ran away from the bear, but he only remembers squatting down and placing his arms over his head to protect himself from the bear's claws and jaws. Given that Hiroshi was the closest of the hikers to the bear, he bore the brunt of its anger. In fact, he bore all the brunt. The brown bear was upon him before he could react. Every part of the man's body that was touched by the bear's claws was torn and gashed. Its claws acted like the blades of a giant blender against the man's skin. As Hiroshi's flesh was being ripped apart, the bear bit into his shoulder. It drove its teeth deep into the muscle and tissue surrounding his bones, causing deep cavity wounds and punctures. The bear didn't stop there, though. It switched its attack to biting his back as he crumpled to the ground under the weight of the bear's body. The gashes torn by the bear's huge canine teeth easily ripped through the skin of his back, and pain seared through his body. Hiroshi couldn't help but scream out in pain as his hiking companions looked on as their friend was tattered before their eyes. With Hiroshi flattened out on the ground, the brown bear turned its jaws toward his rear end. It clamped its teeth onto his buttocks and ripped open puncture wounds. Hiroshi was clearly no threat to this bear, but what it did next would make you think it considered him a potent enemy. As he lay on his stomach, the bear turned its jaws toward his head. It wasn't satisfied with injuring the man, as it had clearly done that. It took his head in its jaws and bit down as hard as it could. Its bottom canines ripped into the flesh as the base of his skull, while its top canines tore into the flesh along his hairline. As it closed its jaws, it tore his scalp back and away from his skull. Hiroshi was clearly incapacitated by every means, but this brown bear wasn't satisfied with that. It had to make sure this man would not endanger it ever again. 
As a final measure to end this very one-sided struggle, the bear opened its jaws wide. It clamped its canines across Hiroshi's face from cheekbone to cheekbone and bit down. His bones cracked and gave way under the bite pressure of the bear's jaws. Crushing his face was the last impartation of violence the bear completed on the man's body. After having his face crushed, Hiroshi lay still. It isn't indicated whether he was unconscious or playing dead, but at any rate the bear had decided he was no longer a danger to it. As it stood over Hiroshi's mangled body, it huffed and panted from the exertion. It stared at him, apparently waiting for any sign of life. As soon as it was satisfied that he was dead, the brown bear slowly walked back toward the direction it had come from and disappeared into the brush. Hiroshi's friends had fled into the bushes nearby. After his cries for help ceased, and they heard the bear leaving, they slowly emerged from their hiding places. They called to each other as they focused their efforts on saving Hiroshi's life. The hikers somehow got Hiroshi out to a location that allowed rescuers to reach him. He was transported to the hospital for life-saving surgery. He would undergo many operations to restructure his facial bones, close his numerous wounds, and clean his gashes. There is no record I could find that indicated the precise number of sutures or stitches the medical teams used to close his wounds, but with injuries like Hiroshi's, they would have to number in the hundreds. His treatment must have continued well past the point that his wounds healed. The reconstruction of his facial bones alone would require several operations and possibly necessitate bones from other parts of his body being transplanted into his face to aid in healing there. Searching the internet proved very difficult to find any further information on how Hiroshi fared following this attack. There isn't any information on what happened with the bears either. It is almost like any information about this attack has been expunged from the internet for some reason. Hiroshi's attack was utilized to help shape policy surrounding bear treatment and avoidance by authorities. In the Denali National Park Bear Human Conflict Management Plan, more than a few pages were written based on information garnered from attacks like Hiroshi's. Given that the second animal he saw fled through the brush as the bear approached him, Hiroshi indicated that he thought there were two brown bears there when he was attacked. If his insights are accurate, then that animal was likely a cub of the bear that attacked him. An attack from a sow bear is usually labeled a defensive attack, and most of the time no action is taken against the bear. Given the bear didn't remain in the area, cover Hiroshi with duff, or guard his body, it was clearly not a predatory attack. As far as the evidence showed, it had not stalked the group and ambushed them. That excluded a predatory attack as well. That leaves the potential that the attack was exclusively defensive in nature but it also begs the question of why was Hiroshi's attack so devastating? The bear had incapacitated him immediately and he was not resisting or fighting with the bear. It seems to me that the injuries he suffered were egregious but unnecessary given his behavior. Analyzing the injuries imparted by the bear, note that there were none listed on Hiroshi's hands and arms, even though he used them to cover his head. This indicates that he wasn't reaching his arms toward the bear to ward its jaws away from him. If he had done that, the bear would have mangled his hands and arms in its attack. The fact that he squatted down seems to indicate that he wasn't sure if he should run or play dead. If he had curled into a ball on the ground instead of squatting, do you think it would have led to different injuries on his body? After reviewing the details of this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think the other animal Hiroshi saw feeling the area was a cub? Did the potential presence of the cubs exacerbate the aggression of this attack? Would bear spray have changed the outcome of this attack? Could Hiroshi or his fellow hikers have utilized a firearm in a competent manner to defend him? What could the hikers have done differently to avoid such a close encounter with an angry brown bear? I will be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.